very warm welcome to all of you in this keynote event and online series launch of four seminal one-hour discussions by the Roundtable, the Commonwealth Journal of International Affairs and the International Development Department at the University of Birmingham. This comes with the support of the Association of Commonwealth Universities. Our focus today is decolonization and black lives, the case of the UK and the Commonwealth. We'll be examining this very important topic, spotlighting the legacies of colonialism in the UK, particularly in the light of post-war immigration into, the, into Britain from the Commonwealth. And we'll be asking whether the Commonwealth still has relevance and resonance for the current generation descended from early migrations. The city of Birmingham, which of course has seen much migration from the Commonwealth countries, is of course preparing to host the 2022 Commonwealth Games. And it's well placed to explore where does the Commonwealth stand on the current debate of decolonization and race? Is the Commonwealth today a modern multiracial organization with important soft power networks and much to contribute to the truly global future? Or is it an organization which is inescapably defined by symbols and legacies of its imperial past? We'll be focusing on the harsh reality and the uncomfortable truth that the British Empire was to a large extent built on the exploitation of black bodies. I think that was captured very vividly in the poster advertising this event. And the early imperial Commonwealth was white supremacist in its character and outlook. In the post-war period, however, the expansion of the Commonwealth to include many newly independent nations, the formation of a neutral secretariat, and the struggles over race in Southern Africa saw the emergence of a new type of Commonwealth, one which was committed to the much needed political and racial equality. In the light of current debate about decolonization and the Black Lives Matter movement, do you think that the Commonwealth today offers a model of reconciliation and understanding, addressing a sometimes troubled shared past and pursuing a vision of a post-racial and democratic future? Or do you feel it's irredeemably tainted by the symbols and memories of its imperial history. Well, to help us answer some of these really important questions are Professor Richard Drayton, Professor of Imperial and Global History at King's College London, who will give a keynote presentation and he'll take part in a discussion with Dr. Reginald Klein Cole. He is Senior Lecturer in African Studies at the University of Birmingham. Now, online questions will be fed into this debate, and I would ask you to use the Q&A function on this Zoom call. Today's discussion will be followed by three further webinars. The first of these will examine the legacies of colonialism in the UK, and particularly in the light of this very important post-war immigration into the UK from the Commonwealth. And we'll be asking again whether the Commonwealth still has resonance for this generation descended from earlier migrations. The next webinar will ask whether the past and in particular the colonial inheritance really matters to the Intergovernmental Commonwealth as it sets about developing its international cooperation that we've seen in action in so many countries across the world. Uh, that cooperation has created fairer and equal societies in many cases 
And the final webinar will look at the variety of the Commonwealth's colonial legacies around the world and the implications this has had. Well, without further ado, I'd like to warmly introduce Richard Drayton. He is Professor of Imperial and Global History at King's College London for his keynote address on decolonization and black lives, the case of the UK and the Commonwealth. Thank you very much, Shini. Uh, and thank you for joining the round table uh, for this event. Now, the word decolonization has become uh, much circulated in recent years with a meaning slightly different from that usually applied by historians. So when historians talk about decolonization, they mean a very specific thing, which is to say the processes by which uh, the empires, particularly the European powers, uh, ended uh, in uh, between 1918 and, uh, and uh, the 19, 1997, you could say, uh, to produce um, a, a system of sovereign nations. So that decolonization traditionally is understood in this kind of very clear political constitutional sense. But there's a very different set of meanings surrounding decolonization, which are those which we're going to be thinking about today, which have to do with addressing the ways in which what was constructed in the midst of the European empires was not just a political dependence of colonies on uh, metropolitan administrations, but also particular structures of uh, power, economy, culture, uh, identity, uh, even uh, bodily imaginaries, uh, which have uh, resilience uh, and which uh, certainly persisted long after uh, and persist long after uh, the ends of the formal uh, empires. So it's in that sense that decolonization has come to mean a kind of an attempt to interrogate the residues of the past and the present, and to ask questions about how these can be transformed uh, in more inclusive and democratic ways to produce a different kind of Britain and a different kind of international society. So what we're going to be thinking about in my short 15 minutes with you uh, is really the history of race in the context of Britain and the British Empire, uh, and the ways in which then uh, this played a part in the construction of the Commonwealth uh, and play a part uh, in uh, the, our own historical moment. Well, it could be argued that uh, in the 16th century uh, and in the early 17th century, uh, the ways in which people thought about bodily difference in the world uh, were very different from the ways in which people thought about it in the late 17th, 18th and 19th and 20th centuries. And that what we have emerging in the course of the 1550 to 1650 period uh, is a kind of way of thinking about and of amalgamating kinds of human beings into particular categories. Uh, the Ethiopian, to describe roughly speaking people in Africa, uh, the European, uh, the American, uh, the Asiatic. What's very interesting is that the first invocation we know of the phrase we Europeans uh, doesn't take place on the continent of Europe. It takes place in Brazil um, in the early 17th century, where the category of the Europeans as being a collective identity, joining all those who are not Amerindian or African is first invoked. So there are ways in which what we're seeing here is the kind of initial constructions of what we would think of later on as whiteness. Uh, and side by side whiteness, other kinds of uh, racialized imaginaries, which came in the course of the later 17th and 18th and 19th centuries and 20th centuries to become fundamental to the ways in which the world was organized by the European empires. But let's just very briefly uh, look back at that kind of foundational period uh, for uh, British societies in a manner of speaking. So. It's probably the simplest way if I do it that way. You might think of the early modern British empire as a kind of democratic expansion if indeed you were only paying attention to those small minorities who were democratically included, who were, to put it very finely, white, propertied Anglican men. 
if you belong to those four, 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 four categories, you could sit in legislatures, you could preside over uh, your own justice system, uh, and you were a fully enfranchised kind of citizen. All other categories and degrees of human being existed in, in various fractional ways relative to these rights. Uh, and in a very extreme way, uh, from the early 17th century, uh, people who are constituted by this new word, uh, Negroes, a word which is borrowed from the Spanish, uh, are understood to have a certain shared identity uh, and a certain shared destiny uh, within the space of British colonial power. So we have a House of Assembly established in Barbados in 1637, uh, third oldest legislature in the in the of West, the Westminster kind in the uh, in the Commonwealth, which sets about in the 1660s passing this extraordinary law, the Barbados Slave Code, an act for the better ordering and governing of Negroes, which explained that Negroes, understood as an amalgamated group, self-evident, were a heathenish, brutish, and uncertain, dangerous pride of people who required extraordinary punitionary laws for the benefit and good of the colony. So in other words, these people were by their nature, beastly, non-Christian, animal-like, that's to say, and deserving of forms of brutal treatment. Um, this is the first legislation which correlates different kinds of legal status with skin color. It is the, what they call a, the masterpiece of legislation uh, and comes to be the model for slave codes in Jamaica, in Virginia, and uh, elsewhere in the British Empire. Race joined to religion, to property, to gender as the key basis for other rights. So we might think of the British Empire in general uh, in its early centuries as based constitutionally on the overlap between the, the imperium of the crown and the dominium of white property owning uh, Anglican men. Uh, with the Roman idea of the pater familias uh, operating, who had a man who had a natural right over women, children, slaves, and animals. What is quite striking is by the end of the 17th century, at the same time as we're seeing the emergence of new ideas of British rights, we have the imagination of the colonies as being a separate space in which the same character of rights did not exist, in which there was a state of exception, as the constitutional and legal theorists would put it. So one critical moment in the, uh, um, the evolution of English liberties uh, is the cementing of Magna Carta um, in 1679 uh, in uh, uh, the, the 31st year of the reign of Charles II, an act for better securing the liberty of the subject and the prevention of imprisonment upon the seas, which essentially guarantees the principle of habeas corpus that people could not be held uh, in custody um, uh, except uh, uh, they were subject to particular criminal trials. In exactly that same year, the Barbados slave laws were brought before the attention uh, of the British judiciary. Uh, and the conclusion was made that I humbly concede the laws there concerning Negroes are reasonable laws, for by reason of their numbers, they become dangerous and becoming a brutish sort of people. It's necessary, at least convenient, to have laws for the government of them different from those of the government laws of England. So this colonial state of exception emerges in the 17th century and becomes a norm, uh, which uh, finds its expression uh, elsewhere uh, in the colonial world. Um, I, I shan't spend long here, but it's very interesting to note that, you know, all of the foundational texts of English liberal doctrine, whether we're thinking of someone like John Locke's uh, uh, Two Treaties of Government or, or Habeas Corpus, um, uh, they uh, provide this escape clause uh, for chattel slavery um, uh, uh, across the seas. Um, so that, you know, Magna Carta, which we think of as an instrument of liberty, uh, could be seen as an instrument of despotism, because what it did was provide a charter for the privileges and rights of those who were so privileged to be included within that democratic space. So this is the paradox of, of the British Empire, and indeed the British Commonwealth in its early history, in its, uh, in its, in its foundational period, that it is a democracy, but it's the character of that democracy that it, it guarantees and sustains forms of unequal treatment and marks these treatment and differences in capacity and kind and civic rights uh, on the bodies of human beings. Um, some of this is theorized by uh, Charles Mills, but uh, given the, the shortness of time, uh, this is not terrain I'll take us into right now. Um, 
the key thing to bear in mind is that what we have in this key period, in this seminal period, is the construction of racialized imaginaries of human similarity and difference, and attached to that ideas of legitimate domination and legitimate use of violence, which come to be exported and become mobile. And they travel from the colonies back to Britain itself, they travel from the early colonies in the Caribbean and in the Americas uh, over to Asia. If we're thinking towards the uh, later uh, empire, um, we can see that um, uh, the operation of the settlement of uh, Australia, Canada, uh, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, operated on these principles of uh, racialized inclusion and exclusion. Uh, sometimes finessed in the context of the Pacific uh, to exclude Chinese migration once that became an issue with the gold uh, of Victoria in the late, uh, late 19th century. And we see the opening up of uh, the, sep the, the state of exception uh, uh, at a new level in the 19th century, in which we have the, the diffusion of forms of democratic government to colonies of white majority settlement, at the same time as we have the export of a new regime of colonial administration called the Crown Colony, in which in fact there was limited or no representative dimension being applied to territories which had black majorities. And this is in a sense the late 19th century world, a world of expanding and advancing civic rights and democracy among people who are racialized as white, uh, and a world of expanding despotisms of various kinds among those who are considered to be uh, um, not white, to be black. And in many ways, this, these divisions are hardening in the late 19th century for reasons which we can explore uh, in discussion later on. But just to kind of turn very rapidly now to the foundations of the Commonwealth. I mean, the Commonwealth as an idea begins essentially as a condominium of the white colonies of settlement with Britain. It, it, it is imagined as a vehicle through, within which the, the, the nationalist aspirations of Australians and New Zealanders and Canadians uh, and white South Africans could be assimilated and included uh, in a wider sphere of British interests. And indeed, uh, if one looks at figures such as Smuts or Rosebery in the early history of the empire, uh, Smuts in particular has a very clearly racialized idea of what the British Commonwealth is going to be. It's going to be essentially a Commonwealth of white men ruling over uh, black men. Well, let me just once again, just very quickly share something with you because it's quite fun. Um, uh, Since those days, things have moved quickly. And now the great cavalcade of empire makes a grand spectacle. So widespread is it, far flung as the Pakasabs would say, that one half is in darkness and the other half is in the light. Those early pioneers have left us a great inheritance, of which we may be justly proud. For might and right go hand in hand in these great possessions beyond the sea. So, um... I think that rather concisely puts the ways in which um, uh, some of the empire was in the dark, whereas the rest of the empire was in the light. Uh, you may, may remember from that video who was in the light. Uh, that was the early 20th century world, um, the world of Smuts uh, and Milner uh, and Rosebery. Uh, but it was a world which was crumbling from below and uh, from the outside. Uh, and uh, very different ideas of democratic inclusion and citizenship were being demanded uh, at the peripheries of the colonial empires. Uh, and, uh, uh, and a very different world was taking shape uh, within uh, this, uh, behind the mask of this uh, uh, white supremacist uh, global uh, imperial order. It's worth bearing in mind because I know it's quite, it has become quite fashionable to say, well, of course, in those days, um, uh, values were different. Uh, so we shouldn't judge them by our values. This is often to forget that uh, as early as the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, uh, there were voices such as the 17th century divine Modwin, uh, Morgan Godwin, who were uh, making clear uh, the iniquity uh, 
uh, of the racialized uh, unequal order which was being constructed in the colony. So uh, the critics were there. The question is what place did they have and what power did they have uh, in that imperial order? So this changes dramatically uh, in after 1945 uh, with that kind of helter-skelter uh, set of readjustments of the international system, which is what historians explore when they think about decolonization. And one of the dramatic things that happens in the context uh, of the Cold War is that when India achieves its independence, India takes the decision to become a republic and to replace the queen as head of state uh, with uh, a president elected uh, or appointed or elected from within uh, the Indian nation. In the context of the Cold War, the importance of binding India to the family was such that what had once been a central principle of the Commonwealth in the early 20th century was very quickly jettisoned. And after 1949, we can see a kind of reinvention uh, of the Commonwealth from below uh, by these newly sovereign states, such as India, uh, Pakistan, Burma, Malaya, Ceylon, Malaysia, Ceylon, uh, Gold Coast Ghana from 57, and then of course the dramatically accelerated pace of decolonization into the 60s, producing this uh, unusual uh, space in which the former uh, central actors were marginalized. So the Commonwealth began to reinvent itself uh, in the post-colonial world, uh, and this reinvention took on a particular pace in the course of the 1960s and 70s and 80s. Uh, um, in which the, 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 the newly independent countries began, in fact, to be more um, clear about the particular interests which they had, which were different from the interests of Britain, uh, and in which around issues like uh, South Africa and Rhodesia, um, uh, views of different kinds were being negotiated through the space of the Commonwealth. Uh, there is, of course, one figure who is very strongly identified in this period, uh, and this is, uh, with, with this set of transformations, this is uh, uh, Sridhar Ramphal uh, uh, of Guyana, uh, who uh, arguably was the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, who um, uh, had the largest presence on the international stage uh, in that uh, period of the end of white minority rule in Rhodesia and the end of apartheid uh, into uh, the late 1980s. So the Commonwealth changed, um, uh, but in many ways, some of the structures of the old uh, Commonwealth uh, remain in place. Uh, if one looks, for example, at things like security cooperation, um, there is a, the system of five eyes that links Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, um, uh, the United States uh, and Britain. Uh, to share signals intelligence. Um, there, there's a quality of economic cooperation and political exchange and diplomatic and uh, inter, uh, um, mutual support which operates within uh, these former uh, um, central parts of the Commonwealth, uh, which is distinct from their relations with the rest of the Commonwealth. Uh, so the, you know, we're, we're looking at a set of changes which have been uh, uh, incompletely negotiated through the system. But more importantly, this this Commonwealth system, you know, scarcely 70, 80, um, in some cases as little as 50 or 40 years since the end of colonial rule, is still attempting to negotiate its way towards uh, a more uh, equal world. And I just, well, I, I, I'm sure that's spoken beyond my 15 minutes. So I just very quickly want to raise some issues uh, that surround the persistence of racialized inequalities. One is obviously is in terms of capital and wealth and resources, the ways in which the forms of accumulation which were possible uh, in the colonial period in which uh, those who were white had particular dominance over control over land and, uh, and markets and so on. This, um, uh, this in many ways persists. Uh, the markets for primary commodities remain uh, in places like London and Paris. Um, uh, or Geneva, um, or Zurich and, uh, for, for some. Um, <clears throat> but there's also the question of uh, cultural inequalities, uh, what people were talking about, the new international information order in the 1970s, uh, informational inequalities persist in some ways have been enlarged uh, during the digital transformation of information. 
Uh, and then beyond that, there are all sorts of cultural legacies, whether it's uh, the distribution of uh, museum artifacts uh, from around the world, uh, the distribution of the archives to which we can understand the historic past of much of the world. These remain distributed as they were during the high colonial period, uh, extremely unequally. Anyway, I've just sort of covered an, a, a very, very broad terrain here, uh, but we must not forget that this plays out not just at these very high abstract levels, but in the ways in which human beings experience their life chances. Who faces the hard end of the law? Who is more likely to be given a post, to be trusted with money, to be given a bank loan, to be uh, given uh, 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 opportunities, um, and also to be uh, uh, protected from punishment? It remains the case in Britain, and to a certain extent even in parts of the world which are black majority places, uh, that the social distribution of life chances remains extremely unequal. Uh, and remains mapped to a certain extent, greater or lesser, whatever our post-racist ideologies, uh, on forms of bodily difference. The past continues to operate within the present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard, for uh, a really engaging exposition of uh, this very difficult background to uh, the Commonwealth that we see today but really um, highlighting the, the terrible brutality and the issue of race that played such an important part in shaping mindsets in, in the early part of the British Empire. I think we can take forward the discussion in the light of um, that very powerful, uh, very reprehensible background of the British Empire, which lingered the attitudes lingered on well into the 20th century. Um, I, think, I think in that context, it would be very interesting to explore with you whether you feel that the Commonwealth of today really has done enough. And this, of course, includes the UK um, in terms of, of promoting the, the very different kinds of values that the Commonwealth now represents rule of law, good governance, democracy, human rights upholding, um, and whether that is uh, a background uh, that should be consigned to the past as Commonwealth pursues much more enlightened principles. Well, it has to be said that uh, in many ways, um, Britain had to be dragged kicking and screaming. Um, um, that the you know the 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 late Fenner Brockway, um, one of the great figures in the history of uh, decolonization and of the British left, um, was putting a bill before Parliament, a private member's bill, to outlaw racial discrimination from as early as the early 1950s. He did this for about nine years. Uh, until finally, with the Labour government uh, uh, that came in and uh, with uh, with Harold Wilson, uh, uh, a law a law was passed. Uh, this was in the context, of course, of uh, uh, the, the the experiences of uh, Caribbean and African and migrants uh, in London in the nineteen uh, uh, in the nineteen fifties. Uh, and so that um, uh, the, the, the ending of the color bar, which, which uh, the history of which in Britain still in some ways has to be written, uh, took place rather slowly. Um, it was still the case that, uh, uh, as I was told by someone uh, who experienced this, that in, uh, if you worked with uh, British Rail in circa 1960, uh, you had to be racialized as white to work inside the station. If you were black, you worked outside. Uh, either uh, uh, in, in, on the tracks or in the coal yard or uh, somewhere that, which was not front of uh, uh, within, the st within the station walls itself. Uh, and, um, you know, forms of, of racial exclusion, racialized exclusion continued even after the passing of that act. And of course, I think we have the dramatic uh, example of the experience of the Windrush uh, uh, migrants uh, uh, over the last uh, decade uh, to demonstrate in very concrete ways uh, in which, uh, uh, in which this, uh, the, the operations of the British state uh, have been extraordinarily unequal. If we're to look at the distribution of income, of uh, education, um, of uh, access to, you know, uh, to, to universities, of who receives first class degrees, who goes on to graduate work, 
Um, uh, we live in a country which is still profoundly uh, unequal in racialized ways, even though uh, it has to be said, it's a country which in terms of its legislation has very strong uh, protections against uh, 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 this kind of uh, um, uh, discrimination. Um, uh, but I mean, um, uh, as to as to to whether whether we can move on, I think in some ways, um, what is interesting about the last year is the way year and two in, is way in, way in which people have been forced to actually pay some attention to the past uh, and to to actually address things which were looming for a long time, but had not actually been formally confronted. Uh, clearly, clearly those, those issues are going to continue. Um, but I'd now like to bring in Dr. Reginald Klein-Cole, um, who is the Senior Lecturer in African Studies at the University of Birmingham, for his response to some of the issues that you've highlighted in your very rich address. Um, I think, Reginald, you have some, some very strong views and perspectives on some of those issues. Um, you're on mute, Reg. You need to unmute. Could, Reg, could you unmute yourself? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, I was just saying, uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you to you and to Richard um, for sort of a brilliant opening, I think, to the session and to say I hope my views won't be too strong <laughs> for, for anybody. Um, I would like to start, I think, at sort of where Richard ended his discussion, sort of the, the, the fascinating, the, the thought provoking, um, I think, suggestion um, in his presentation. And here I'm sort of quoting from um, the abstract I received in advance um, that, quote, we remain in Britain and in the Commonwealth in an in-between space in which forms of inclusive political doctrines and vision are entangled with highly unequal societies and an unequal international order. Um, I think that's a good place to start because my focus is sort of really sort of thinking about the Commonwealth and Africa's relationship to Africa. Africa in the contemporary period. Um, I'll try and use two quick examples, I think, um, shortly to illustrate some of the issues that I would like to raise. But I think I would like to sort of follow on um, some of what Richard has already said. I mean, the point that um, but we are not in the present time in the contemporary period. We are not simply, we don't simply find ourselves in the situation we described. Right. What has happened is that history and geography and the whole series of processes, etc., have contrived to create the circumstances and the conditions which have ended up having the outcomes that he sort of is talking about. So I'm, I'm particularly I'm interested at you know in this um, in between state, partly because I think in some ways um, speaking as um, somebody from the African Commonwealth, um, in some ways I think. I could suggest that everything has changed. You know, the world of the Commonwealth has changed in all sorts of ways, but there are lots of other ways in which I think it has remained, as Richard pointed out, um, pretty much similar to um, earlier decades. Uh, and consequently, I would like to suggest, as a deliberate provocation, I might add, that much of what has so far passed for attempts at decolonization, the processes of decolonizing at the focus on Black and specifically, in my case, continental African lives and the Commonwealth. All of this is important. All of this is timely. A lot of this is progressive and most of it is relevant to our lives, to everyday existences in the present time. Now, however, I do think that a lot of these interventions have tended to focus less on the unequal international order than on what Richard describes as the inclusive political doctrines and visions and unequal societies. Uh, so I could, I suppose, give ways that slightly to be less provocative and say that Commonwealth institutions appear to have been more direct, maybe even more proactive in the case of the latter and more tentative, more diplomatic and more reactive in the case of the former. Uh, this, of course, 
an observation which goes to the very heart of the Commonwealth as institution, as practice, as representation, and as complex and evolving lived realities, all aspects of which Degna and Richard have alluded to already. Now, the Commonwealth, by its own admission, is a loose and voluntary association of independence and equal member states in pursuit of shared values, aspirations, and goals, which are identified in its charter. Now, each country is responsible for its own policies, the charter tells us. In practice, however, and at the risk of doing the Commonwealth a disservice, it does come across as largely an advocacy organization with a declared commitment to improving the lives and livelihoods of its citizens with an important sideline in providing policy advice and technical assistance aimed at promoting quote unquote development, which operates on the basis of, and I quote the charter, principles of consensus and common action, mutual respect, inclusiveness, transparency, accountability, legitimacy, and responsiveness. Right. But I wonder, uh, in the context of that very important quality of respect, mutual respect that you just addressed, um, whether you feel that the actions of a country like Germany to, towards Namibia uh, uh, have really made a, a difference and whether that set some kind of precedent uh, in particular for the UK uh, to, to act in a similar way or consider uh, potential action uh, in its case? I think it doesn't go far enough. It, it's important, the response is important, but in my view, it doesn't go far enough. And um, I suspect that would be the view of a lot of, um, of other Africans. Now, I do think also, however, that Part of the problem that we need to address, um, one of the, the, the points that I think I'd sort of like to make here is that in picking out and carving out the Commonwealth, we're creating, in a sense, I mean, all administrative zones, political entities are artificial in that sense, but we're creating, if you like, an even more artificial demarcation within a world that is becoming increasingly globalized. And I think there are major problems there. Certainly, um, one of the issues that um, it seems to me needs addressing by the Commonwealth is exactly how it fits in within this world of enlarging entities, if you like, right? of a world in globalization of transnationalism in all sorts of ways. And I'm not quite sure. I think um, Richard's point would suggest that it is part of an ongoing debate. I, 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 would, I would go along with that. Now, where does it fit in? Right, in Richard, the case I wonder, of, I wonder whether you'd like to come back on that point specifically. Well, I think specifically looking at the German uh, uh, offer to Namibia. Namibia is a country of about two and a half million people. So that we're talking about a transfer amounting to about 500 euros per head. Um, uh, it's pretty much chump change. Uh, and I think the interesting comparison for me, because I think what underlies this, as most people here will know, but some of you may not, is that Germany perpetrated a genocide uh, in Namibia, uh, in what was Southwest Africa in the late 19th century, in which a very large proportion of the population was murdered uh, in counterinsurgency actions. Now, if you compare this proposed settlement by Germany to the settlements that were made by Germany after 1945 to the State of Israel, uh, which amounted to what were at the time three or four billion marks, which today would be probably about 10 times that. We come to like 30 or 40 billion uh, uh, euros today. Um, we're dealing in other words with, with it's almost as if one, uh, one genocide is less important than another. Uh, and that, um, uh, and it, goes, it doesn't amount to, uh, uh, the question is how this will be spent, you know, what will be, uh, will it be a state to state transfer, will it be spent by Germany on projects which Germany wants to spend it on, uh, which might mean, of course, the money staying in Germany and going to German contractors who supply the infrastructure which is then put in place. Um, I mean, there are all kinds of questions about this, but I find this settlement deeply unsatisfactory. Um, uh, the Germans have also pointedly refuse to accept that this is these are reparations. Uh, that's the yeah. language with which they have specifically refused to use. Um, uh, and I think this 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 is this is this is this is not a, this is not an, an entirely satisfactory outcome. 
uh, and the, that, yeah, pardon me. Sorry, Kashi. Sorry, I was just going to uh, go back to the issue, I suppose, of uh, the newly independent nations emerging into what we know as the modern Commonwealth in the aftermath of the Second World War. Because yes. arguably, Britain found it extremely difficult at a time of war, stretching over six years, uh, to maintain its empire. Um, and arguably, the reasons for the development of independent nations was not based on uh, a requirement to address the wrongs of the past, but actually quite a shrewd economic measure for Britain to, to really uh, lose some of its economic obligations, which were a great drain. Um, I wonder, Reg, if you'd like to come in on that particular point, uh, casting ahead to the Commonwealth and the shape of the modern Commonwealth. Well, that I think is, I find that question sort of particularly interesting one, because again, as I say, and sort of going back very briefly to a point I made earlier, I think the Commonwealth's focus on quote unquote development is what links it to the Namibian and German case that you were just talking about. It is what also makes this whole debate so topical and literally up to the minute, because we are here in GP, of course, in the middle of this of discussions and disagreements around maintaining GB's level of foreign aid. You know, or, or not. And that entire debate, I think, sort of revolved around not politics, not ideology, but questions of poverty and need and want in the so called poorer parts of the world, certainly in Africa and Commonwealth Africa, was sort of singled out. And it did seem to me that that speaks directly to the kinds of issues that we're meant to be addressing, you know, and when we talk about decolonization and decolonizing the mind, among other things. Now, why were questions, are these questions being raised within the institutions of the Commonwealth? They're certainly being debated in some sections of sort of media, certainly being debated across the academic world, but are they being raised? I don't know, I don't have an inside track on that. They're being raised within the institutions of the Commonwealth. And, and, and how does that fit in, if you like, to the, the, the way that it works with the modus of, Randy, of, of, of a consensual you know, set of, of, of decision-making processes? Well, I think we can, we can continue, certainly in a very vibrant discussion on many of those issues. But um, I'd just like to throw out a call to our audience, if you would like to ask a a question um, to be discussed by either um, Richard or Reg, uh, please feel free to do so through the Q&A function on this webinar. But um, just picking up on, on some other issues uh, about the Commonwealth being consensual, and particularly in the light of this very difficult history emerging out of, out of the British Empire, whether the Commonwealth should really push harder to make those core values, which are so important to people around the Commonwealth, absolutely obligatory. Because um, there are many instances of uh, countries that don't actually abide wholeheartedly to all those principles, many instances of breaches. And is there more, given the Commonwealth's history, um, that the Commonwealth can do to implement those, those laudable core values. Richard. Well, I think the core values of the Commonwealth are still in, at some level in the process of emerging. Um, because of course, um, the, 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 the double life of the Empire Commonwealth was that on the one hand, it was a family of democracies. On the other hand, uh, the other legacy of that system was if were forms of proconsular military despotisms. Uh, and that's in some ways it's, um, if you look at, um, uh, at um, the ways in which colonies were ruled, um, they were often ruled in highly non-consensual ways. So it's not terribly surprising in some cases that the forms of government which persisted afterwards um, uh, or, or, or emerged afterwards, often operated also in ways that are, were not transparent and democratic. That, that was also part of the legacy. So I think we're in a, I, I, I want to give a kind of very long-term and optimistic way of framing this, which is to say that I think we're in the midst of a, of a very uh, 
long, two or three century long uh, interrogation of our how we live in the world uh, by democratic principles. Uh, and that we've operated with two steps forward, one step back in some ways. Um, but there is a kind of momentum around the principle uh, that government should serve and uh, respond to the wills and interests of uh, the majority of people uh, in every territory. Um, and uh, uh, we are moving, uh, we are in the process of, of discovering what the values of the Commonwealth really are um, through um, this particular movement. A very interesting point that uh, uh, something that's been raised from our audience, uh, whether, whether the aspirations of the new post-war Commonwealth to establish political and democratic equality as such really reflected any kind of change in Britain in the same period or whether it was it was a superimposed aspiration. Reg. Uh, um, I, I think it was a superimposed set of aspirations. I think these are these were always negotiable and they continue to be negotiated. I think, again, I think it's a question of scale. I'm not quite sure how much attention is being paid to the negotiations that are taking place, for example, and I concentrate on that in, within Commonwealth Africa itself. What kind of you know, negotiations are taking place between and within Commonwealth African countries? Who knows? Um, what, for example, does the more recent inclusion of Mozambique or Rwanda, what sort of, how does that alter the dynamics, you know, sort of traditional historical dynamics of the way that they operate on the question of history and baggage, baggage being, if you like, introduced, you know, into the Commonwealth and the way it functions and questions of its ideology. Um, I do genuinely think there is willingness um, and I think there are institutions within the Commonwealth that create space. I mean, the, Afri the, the Association of Commonwealth Universities, I mean, that's sort of an integral part of opening up some of the debates that we're talking about now, you know, to, to raise those questions, you know, sort of about decolonizing knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's all of that. I am not too sure that we can actually make as much sense as we ought to about what is going on within the Commonwealth or let's subsect if we lack of the Commonwealth without linking the, those areas, the subsets of the Commonwealth, to neighboring areas, to the regional economic organizations, to, you know, sort of wider organizations, if you like, and institutions. I'm not too sure we're paying enough attention to that. I think the focus on the Commonwealth and its survival and how we might continue to make it relevant into the future is at one and the same time, you know, a process of inclusion, but also of exclusion. Despite, I, wonder, you know, I wonder on that point whether whether you feel uh, this is another question that has been raised from the audience yeah. today. Whether whether the Commonwealth, because of its continuing links with the British monarchy, really could succeed in in becoming a truly post-colonial organization, mm -hmm. or whether it was um, rather. Uh, with great difficulty bound inextricably to its past and the associations with the crown. Well, I think that um, it's very easy for the queen to be welcomed. If the British continue to choose that the queen serve as their head of state and their representative, there's no reason why that particular representative of Britain cannot be welcomed uh, as uh, in meetings of heads of state. Uh, so I think that, that Britain's relationship to its own form of representative government and its own constitutional order should not pose any serious problem uh, for the, the Commonwealth if the Commonwealth was to become, as it probably will become in the 21st century, uh, a system of republics. It won't be that long, I would imagine, before places like Australia and Canada uh, take that particular turn. Uh, there's no intrinsic. And then once they do, then it becomes a little bit absurd for places like Jamaica to continue to hold on. Um, it'll be interesting to see, in fact, whether um, uh, who, le who, who forms the vanguard and who ends up in the, uh, in the rear guard when that particular moment comes. But I, 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 I think the, the monarchy is, um, I mean, the question is really whether uh, anyone else can quite have the sort of um, 
uh, Irenic um, central role which uh, Elizabeth II played. And absolutely, uh, we, we saw that, didn't we, at yeah. the, um, the Choggan held in London, where, where the Buckingham Palace discussions and meetings were absolutely fascinating and much appreciated across the nations of the Commonwealth. Reg, I rather wonder what your view is on this subject, because um, there is a different kind of experience from, from Commonwealth country discussions where the Queen is head of state and some of the other nations. Um, I think symbolism matters. <laughs> There's sort of absolutely no question about that. And I, I think it would be a mistake to underestimate that. But I think too, it would be equally a mistake to overestimate the relevance of the Commonwealth to the lives of all everyday lives of the Commonwealth Africans. All right. The most of the people I know have <laughs> come across, <laughs> you know, the Commonwealth is associated with the games and the heads of government conference. Now that's a niche group within the various countries sort of who are aware of the ACU, for example, and what it does, and other elements, you know, of the Commonwealth and its work, but for most people. I mean, it doesn't even, being, you know, sort of membership of the Commonwealth doesn't even appear on, I am sure, the vast majority of African passports anymore. It used to, used to be a citizen of the Commonwealth, and that used to be alongside it. That's gone, <laughs> because, of course, you're dealing predominantly with the public. So I think there's all sort of various, you know, sort of interesting ways in which things could develop. I'm, I think I have to agree with Richard, we ended up with multi-speed Commonwealth. I think right. um, you, you brought up some really fascinating issues, but uh, in a very timely way, as we look mm -hmm. ahead to hopefully the mm -hmm. successful hosting of the 2022 <laughs> Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, um, the Games and Choggan, it has to be said, um, are two very good examples of highly successful aspects of the Commonwealth, and certainly aspects of the Commonwealth that resonate far wider than, than the nations that are included mm. inside. Um, mm. I wonder whether more can be made as Birmingham faces uh, the preparations, the, the last preparations and the countdown to the Games, whether it can really highlight all the achievements of the Commonwealth in, in the post-war history um, with the, the impetus, the goodwill and the desire for the Commonwealth to succeed. Um, Richard, in a historical context, do you think that can be brought about? I think there are many ways in which the, the Commonwealth can be translated uh, into something that people understand as part of uh, their contemporary social experience. Uh, I think at the moment for many people, particularly for younger people, uh, the Commonwealth has a slightly uh, nebulous character. It's this kind of odd thing which they vaguely know about, but uh, think may well be a historical thing rather than something about the present. So there are ways in which it can be made more, uh, more vivid in the lives of, uh, uh, of ordinary people possibly by asking questions uh, of um, what is the Commonwealth? What is the wealth that we consider to be common or that we'd wish to be common? Um, what are these values uh, which uh, we share um, apart from sharing a common history? Uh, there are conversations which need to be have about citizenship, both national citizenship and global citizenship in which the, the, the term Commonwealth can play a part. Um, whether this will happen in Birmingham in 2023 um, is another question. Um, Reg, we're nearing the end of this discussion, but uh, mm -hmm. I wonder whether you would be prepared to pick up that specific point about uh, really reinforcing the value of something as successful as Commonwealth Games in a globalized world. Um, I think we could give it a good try. <laughs> I mean, I know of colleagues in Birmingham, they're speaking from Birmingham at the moment, I know colleagues in Birmingham who've got plans to try and do precisely that, but in ways which speak to the ongoing need to continue to decolonize and to be critical of and to be, you know, um, what's the word, not, not, not subtle, to be 
to be both sort of critical and progressive in inverted commas, you know, of the Commonwealth and its history, etc. So questions are going to be raised, as I say, I'm aware of various, you know, sort of plans, but those would tend to be sort of small scale plans. But in some ways, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think in very many ways, and I will go, I go back to this, I think the Commonwealth, the future of the Commonwealth must rest in its capacity, you know, sort of going forward to be able to deal with what the different sections of the Commonwealth consider as important to them, as immediate, you know, as crucial, as vital on the ground at their level. <laughs> Right. And I Richard, think we need to be able to, to, to look towards, you know, sort of ways of achieving that. Richard, I wonder whether you have some final thoughts on that issue of looking forward in a, a very positive way, uh, hopefully after, after a period uh, of, of limited timescale in terms of COVID restrictions, when uh, a really a meeting of many nations can represent a, a tremendous impetus and injection of energy for the Commonwealth to truly make itself relevant. I think that should be part of the ambition of the organizers. Uh, and uh, uh, there should be some kind of systematic plan of communication which brings this strange word Commonwealth uh, into the everyday lives of school children. Uh, and of people in the societies. Um, so it becomes something that actually has some kind of meaning um, in terms of how they understand uh, the business of citizenship. Um, because ultimately at the heart of this is the question of citizenship. Uh, what are the, the forms of collective uh, society to which both local, national and global, to which we claim membership uh, and which we have a shared investment uh, both not just in its past, leave the past behind, but uh, in its futures. And um, just on a, a, a final moment to dwell on the opportunities ahead, Reg, I wonder whether uh, you feel that there is an opportunity for nations in Africa, uh, Africa is your area of specialization, of course, to really take up the Commonwealth challenge as we focus on, on the games going forward and on the next Trogum, hopefully, uh, which will take place sooner rather than later. Um, I think the countries that are in a position to be able to afford to send you know, teams to the games will do so. Those will be the countries you know, where there will be publicity about the games, where there will be debates and discussions about the Commonwealth Games and where it fits in within you know, sort of the existence of the wider Commonwealth and its links to present day Africa. Um, I don't think it's going to be universal, not even across the Commonwealth um, African countries. Some countries are not going to be in any position to be able to afford to send teams. I suppose there the Commonwealth Secretariat and various other institutions might be able to, to offer assistance, but then we're back in the territory we started off with, which is a sort of question of aid <laughs> and what it means <laughs> and if we're sort of going to go on depending on quote-unquote aid without critically asking questions about why and how into the 21st century this continues to be the case, then you know, the, the, the Commonwealth's future, I suspect, will be sort of less promising than it might otherwise be. Well, um, as we near the conclusion of this very vibrant discussion on decolonization and Black lives, the case of the UK and the Commonwealth, I think we've come around to actually rather a positive point uh, to, to uh, continue this series of discussions. Um, but before we conclude, I wonder um, if you, Richard, would just like to, to make a few uh, final thoughts and Reg, I'll come to you for yours before we finish this webinar. Well, I haven't actually prepared any final thoughts, um, but I think um, uh, to return to, to the theme which I was touching on just a moment ago, uh, I think that the, the most important thing to have come out of that uh, uh, global response to the killing of George Floyd in the United States in 2020 uh, are a set of conversations about what kind of society uh, 
uh, what kind of world would we like to live in? So that, you know, when uh, people become concerned about American police brutality around the world, it's because they have a particular investment in the idea that the world should be a different kind of place. Uh, and uh, I think the extent to which we can, we can, we can invigorate uh, um, ideas of the Commonwealth. So I noticed, for example, on the Q&A stream, there was an intervention made where, which referred to the, um, the, the Singapore protocols as defining the values of the Commonwealth. Well, I mean, that's the problem in a way, is that the Singapore protocols are a document which I don't know the content of. And if I don't know it, I could, I could bet that about 99.99% of people who heard the Commonwealth don't know about the content of that document either. Uh, and uh, and, it, and it, 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 tell, it speaks to the ways in which this is a dead word. Um, and uh, uh, family, co uh, the Commonwealth and organizations rather like families need to be reinvigorated in every generation um, uh, through the questions which people ask, through the kind of living relationships which they build. Thank you so much. Um, Reg, some final thoughts uh, on decolonization. Um, right, yeah, I, I hadn't prepared final thoughts, but again, I'll check up from Richard's point, which is that if the Commonwealth is to have a future, then I think the young, the current generation have to be an integral part of sort of redefining what the Commonwealth means for them. And they are going to be, as individuals, bringing to bear on that task, their individual, their personal, their family experiences and their own everyday experiences of living, for example, as young black people in Britain, you know, and that we need to be able to, to, to include their input into the way that we try and refine and redefine what the Commonwealth is or what to be or might be, or indeed whether or not it might even be a long-term future for it. Gentlemen, thank you so much for such an interesting and vibrant discussion on this, this really very relevant issue for today's Commonwealth. Um, it is an issue that the Commonwealth is very well placed to continue discussions. I'm sure those discussions will continue well beyond the confines of this first keynote webinar uh, to launch the series today. Um, I think we've all got some homework to do in terms of uh, brushing up on our knowledge of the Singapore protocols. And perhaps <laughs> that's something else that we can pick up on on a, a discussion later on. But uh, I would like to issue my thanks to the audience, of course, um, and particularly to our wonderful panelists uh, today who have been Professor Richard Drayton, who is Professor of uh, Imperial and Global History at King's College London, and Dr. Reginald Klein-Cole, who is, of course, Senior Lecturer at the University of Birmingham. My uh, deep thanks to both the roundtable, all the people involved in making this wonderful seminar and webinar happen, um, and the discussions that will stimulate further conversations to continue, and particularly to the University of Birmingham, uh, and uh, we very much hope that the university is going to play an important role in the uh, Commonwealth Games when it, when it comes to Birmingham. But uh, for the moment, thank you very much for attending. Thank you.